It is that time again, uh, live with Ingenium Books. I'm Bonnie Wagner Stafford, and this is John Wagner Stafford on the other side of the screen. Hi, John. Uh, hello again. So today, those of you watching this live, um, it's right now, and of course, this is available on replay as well. It'll be posted on our website, and uh, you'll be able to see it on our Facebook page, and it's live right now on YouTube and Facebook. Um, we It's the second of, uh, of our audiobook series. Last week, or two weeks ago, we were here... Um, talking about audiobooks, the market aspect, why they're popular, some of the trends um, for uh, reader consumption of audiobooks. And today, we promised two weeks ago, um, today we are going to dig a little bit deeper into the um, aspect of uh, nonfiction authors who want to narrate their own audiobooks. Um, so, that is where we will start. Now, I will encourage anyone, everyone, anyone who's listening to or watching this, leave us a question. If you are um, an author who either has narrated and produced your own uh, audiobook or you are considering it, feel free to post questions and we'll do our best to um, review and, uh, and answer them. We will have a couple of links that we will share with you at the appropriate place as we're going through the chit chat. So the first thing though, John, uh, and we're doing this with you because you have an extensive background in sound. You're not just another pretty face. So we won't go through the whole detail, but. Yeah. Right. You know, you, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm just a pretty face. <laughs> <laughs> Although you are a pretty face too, but. Um, so uh, the, in the first series, we we talked about your background, and uh, you know we're we're a publisher, but we we also have deep experience with uh, with audio, and that is uh, largely because of uh, you, film, television, sound producing, video game production, with focusing on sound, um, and that sort of thing. So you really know what you're talking about when it comes to audio. Mm -hmm. I think so, and, and yeah. you know we're gonna we're gonna start with with why I uh, know I'll, I'll let you I'll let you continue with the why actually yeah well but that was exactly where I was gonna go you know where I was gonna go which is <laughs> why would an author of nonfiction consider or why should an author of nonfiction consider narrating their own audiobook why produce an audiobook I think we covered two weeks ago in the previous video um, where we talked about that but why would an author want to consider narrating their own? Yeah, a, a couple of reasons. I don't think there are a lot of reasons, but there are a couple of reasons. And I think the one that stands out the most to be the most important to me is um, twofold. And this is one, one notion. The reader wants to hear from the author directly. The reader builds trust and builds a relationship with the author as they're reading the book. So why not come closer to the author by listening to the author's voice? And uh, and therefore, the reader will have a better, stronger connection to the author, maybe building a little more trust and looking forward to their next book, their next uh, batch of information or their next nonfiction uh, information that they'll pass along. So it's all about the personal connection for me, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, it's kind of fun to narrate your own uh, work. You know exactly what you're trying to say, but it isn't always. So even though the reader um, likes to hear from the author, specifically of nonfiction, um, it's not it's not always possible or advisable for an author to narrate their own. And that's kind of what we're gonna talk about for the rest of this session this morning. We're gonna run through, uh, if you say, okay, I do wanna narrate my own uh, nonfiction book, what do you need to consider in terms of your environment? What do you need to consider for equipment? And then we're actually gonna talk about some narration tips. Um, so let's start with the first thing, John, um, the environment and, and you kind of talk about the environment as a source. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So in 35 plus years of working with audio, nothing has changed over time. And what I mean by that is 
when I was learning how to record music, when I was learning how to record voiceover in the advertising industry, when I was learning and experiencing and actually doing all this work, the most important message that I got from my mentors and the most important message about recording that I followed was the source has to be the best it can be. And here's a little bit of a, a visual. Um, imagine, and talking about an audiobook, imagine me sitting out on my balcony my new balcony, my new office balcony, soon to be waves splashing up on the beach with birds and wind and trees. And I'm sitting outside and I'm trying to record my uh, audiobook. It doesn't work because you've got all this extraneous noise getting in the way of the message that you're trying to convey. Walk inside to your home, or if I walk inside to my office and I go into my small room with the padding and the microphone, I don't hear any of that and I can concentrate on the quality source sound, which would be my voice going into the right equipment. So source sound is, is the most important thing that you can pay attention to when recording your own audiobook. And how do you make that determination? Um, I am always fascinated when you start talking about how sound bounces around. So uh, you don't necessarily want to be sitting outside on your balcony, but you don't necessarily just want to be coming inside to any room in your house either. What, what, what do authors need to think about when they, in, the, in, in choosing the right environment? Yeah, uh, a couple of key things. Uh, one is extraneous noise, whether you're outside or inside. And in fact, recording outside, if there was no, if there was no birds and no wind and it was silent, that would be the perfect recording environment. And, and what I mean by that is that the sound just goes away. It doesn't reflect off of walls or there's no reverb or reflection of the sound, which is what gets you into trouble when you come into your home. Um, with parallel surfaces, the sound will reflect back and forth. And that's what creates what we know as either an echo or mo most uh, more uh, appropriate uh, reverb. And then it, and you hear the size of the room, you hear this sound of, of the room and you don't want to hear that. So coming inside uh, with no extraneous sounds, no ambulances in the background, no dogs barking, no kids playing in the parks, uh, no wind or, or shattering your, your uh, window sills, uh, find a place in your home that is small, that does not have parallel surfaces, which is almost impossible. So you can, you can do some, a few things to get around that. Uh, and those things are by padding it. What we've done recently in where we're living right now is we've taken the curtains off of one of the walls and hung them up in, in a very small uh, box-like structure. Um, and we've recorded our own audio books there with the right equipment and it's worked very well. So inside, no parallel walls, buffer the sound with curtains or or foam you can buy commercial foam and whatnot so that the sound is not reverbing reverberating off of parallel walls can can we just dig into the that notion of the the parallel walls uh for a moment um people will be familiar with those eggshell carton shaped things i mean if you go to any sound or production studio when i worked in television we would go into a very small room to voice our television stories and the walls would be covered with this foam with you know, you know literally look like egg cartons on the wall so but what is it about that shape of things so, why why do people put those things on the wall yeah so what the what that does about the shape uh, is that it moves the sound into a different direction so that it takes a lot longer for the sound to come back to the source. H hard to describe without without maybe some better uh, graphics, but uh, if the sound, you know, when you go to a, you're outside and you're calling to a mountain, there's a mountain in front of you and then there's you and your sound hits the mountain and where does it go? It comes back to you. If that mountain was on an angle, your sound would hit the mountain and go away and your face to a mountain or a wall the sound is going to come back to you and you don't want that you want the sound to reverberate you want the sound to move in all sorts of different directions it takes a longer period of time to get back to the source or the microphone or where your mouth is so uh, to be practical turn this into something practical the more stuff you have in the room if you've got couches and things on the wall 
that are not glass and glassy or, or hard surfaced, soft surfaced stuff, uh, that would be, that would help your recording environment. Macrame, macrame hangings. Remember those days, you know, you do macrame, have paintings. So have yeah, time. rooms full of, I'm still here. I still hear you. So yeah, we have some internet connection issues with, uh, okay. here, hopefully it'll be okay. Um, so the reason that, that this is important in case we glossed over this, um, is that when, thinking about that reader experience and that reader connection, if you're not producing quality sound in an environment that isn't distracting, your reader will be distracted. And so the reader, I, I mean, we were listening to a podcast the other day and I was like, I can't, I'm really interested in this topic, but I can't listen to this because the guest was calling in via a telephone line that was all crackly. I mean, similar to an experience we might be creating here with internet connection issues with us getting shaky, people will lose tolerance for that. Mm -hmm. um, but so that's what we're that's what we're talking about is minimizing those things that will turn off a reader who is listening to the finished product. Can you go ahead and record an audio in a sound where, in the room where the sound is bouncing around? Yes. Uh, is it going to help your sales of that audiobook? No. No. And, and you know, we, quality is important. And, you know, not only the sound of the room or the source sound, which I always come back to as being the most important element of uh, what you can do to uh, help the quality of the audiobook that you're recording yourself. Um, the quality is important. Uh, if another aspect of, of why good quality source sound is that once you're done recording, and we'll get to this in more in more detail in a second. But once you're done recording, then someone else has to take that over and and uh, work with the sound to you know pull things together, eliminate breaths, eliminate pauses, eliminate mistakes in your speaking, and the if the quality of the recording is good they have less work to do if they have less work to do then they're going to spend less time and if they're going to spend less time you or they will probably uh, you will spend less money or they will spend less money working at making your product high quality and the best it can be right okay uh let's move on to equipment now because uh you know environment is one thing oh my goodness now i've chosen the spot now how am i going to get it done and there's all kinds of uh consumer available uh equipment people are podcasting and recording at home so there's there's lots of options out there but it makes a difference the the equipment that you choose makes a difference um so talk to us about what people will look for and i have an anecdote that i'm going to interject when when you start talking about the mics at the right spot yeah so <laughs> there, there are um to put keep it simple there are three basic pieces of equipment that you need to uh, record your or narrate your own audiobook. Aside from the environment, you've created the right environment, you've got stuff on the walls, you've got your blankets, your macrame, whatever. So that's taken care of. Now we need to get your voice into the digital medium, onto a computer, and and then it's got to get off of that computer, you know, to either an editor or up to the platform that's going to distribute the the audiobook. So the first thing, and we'll follow the chain of events, your sound environment's clean, then you're going to be speaking. What are you going to do when you're speaking? You're speaking into a microphone. So the microphone is probably one of the next most important uh, things that you can take care of. There are so many out there. I can't speak to anyone uh, that would do you well, but this is important for you to remember. A cardioid microphone is important, and to the best as you can, a unidirectional microphone is important. There are not a lot of unidirectional microphones out there that are affordable, but uh, cardioid is very important. And uh, we have, a, I think, a list of 10 or 15 microphones that you can take a look at. I encourage you to, to actually do some research, read some of the information about the microphones that are out there, and decide which one is best for you. Price is gonna play a role, accessibility is gonna play a role, the look and feel of the microphone for some people might play a role. How does it look, how does it feel? Um, yeah. 
I want to, this is where I want to inter, interject. Uh, unidirectional versus omnidirectional. Um, and, and unidirectional is important because it will focus where it is recording the sound. Um, it will choose a fairly narrow spot. So if you had a unidirectional microphone and you only had that option to record sitting outside on John's new balcony, um, the unidirectional microphone is gonna be much more helpful than an omnidirectional microphone. And an omnidirectional microphone can be fantastic for lots of other things. We have a very good omnidirectional microphone. And this is the anecdote that I was gonna share. And we had our great microphone set up and we had this, we were visiting my sister in Toronto and we were recording the audiobook of, I forget, Rock your business, maybe. Rock your business, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and um, we had a, a room that was quiet and there were no parallel walls. It was up in a uh, in the upper floor of a house, so of an older house, you know, so they had the angled walls, so there's no square walls. But this microphone was so good that it picked up every bird chirp. It picked up the garbage truck three blocks away. It picked up the airplanes flying over. We were fairly close to the airport. Um, and so that microphone was too sensitive for the purpose that we were using it for. Uh, so unidirectional will focus the sound and that will help uh, mitigate some of the weaknesses in your environment uh, as well if you choose a unidirectional microphone. All right, next piece of uh, equipment, John. So the next piece of equipment is going to be the recording device and that typically ends up being a computer a macintosh computer a windows based computer and uh there are a couple of of elements here i mean we use both macintosh and windows um do most of the recording on the macintosh uh, there's a lot of software out on the macintosh that is uh helpful when you're recording editing mixing and doing all of the sound production stuff um, but Windows is also very good. Um, but the elements, and again, I encourage you to do your own research about what's going to fit you best. Um, Macintosh might be a little more expensive. Windows might be a little less expensive uh, or accessible. And then there are different softwares that work and don't work on any one of those platforms. Um, but the two pieces of core information that are important for the computer is that it uses a dual core processor. Um, which will be running your computer at a speed that will allow you to capture the digital audio and work with that digital audio. Um, and that it has probably more than eight gig of RAM. Uh, so not hard disk space, but, and I'm using an old term here, but RAM. So it's the, the memory that's inside your computer that is always active and always storing and using, using the computer's memory. It's not your hard disk space. That's a different thing. So at least I would say eight gigs because you're gonna be running programs that are heavy enough and you know more and more. I mean, we have, we have a Mac that's got eight gigs and it slows down because we, we have too many, uh, the software is too big now. So we need to increase that. Um, so those are the two most important things. Uh, and go ahead. I was just going to say also that uh, in our experience, then w you get your environment and you get the right microphone and then where you place the microphone is also important. There was, uh, I was doing some podcasts um, with, uh, with an organization and I had the microphone sitting, I can't remember, fairly close to the computer or what, did I have it clipped on the monitor? I, I don't remember, but the fan from the computer was being picked up by our very sensitive, very high quality omnidirectional microphone, but it was almost unusable. So the, 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 where you put the computer, and that's why you will also see sometimes the microphone stands that, and the advantage of that is that, that it's the, the, the microphone is not connected to a hard surface where it might pick up vibrations or the sound actually from the computer fan. In the very funny looking crude setup that we have here where we are, we actually have, we have a yoga strap where we have the microphone suspended from uh, uh, bars that we have hang, where we have these curtains hanging around this little square space, and we have the microphone descending and hanging, so it's not uh, not touching any other surface. It's suspended there, so you can look for that. Um, we I, I, is there something else on equipment, or are we ready to move to the actual narration tips? 
Nia, no, there's one other one other thing uh, about uh, equipment, and it's the software that you would use inside the computer right. to do the recording. And there are, again, a number of pieces of software out there. Uh, three that come to mind that I've used uh, for recording and, uh, and narrating audiobooks. Um, in the Macintosh environment, there's GarageBand. In the Windows environment, and, and, and there's uh, Pro Tools, which is a more professional uh, system, but but also available uh, in, in a free version, but you need a, a honking computer to run that. Um, and on the Windows environment, there are a few, but there's one that works well for all platforms that seems to be very popular, very easy to use, and that's called Audacity. And uh, that's going to give you pretty much everything you need in terms of recording your audio, fixing and cleaning up your audio, editing your audio, whether you're doing it or somebody else is doing it, and outputting the audio in the formats that you need to upload to any distributor or move to uh, an editor or a third party who's gonna work with your digital audio after the fact. So microphone, your environment, the computer, and the software being, uh, I suggest Audacity is one thing to take a take a look at. GarageBand's good, Pro Tools is another one, and there are a few others out there as well. Great. Okay. So um, decision-making time for an author. There's a lot to consider. We've gone through environment. We've gone through equipment. Um, we've talked about why readers want to connect, but it's still, even if you get all that stuff right, it still might not be the right thing for you to narrate your own audiobook. And that all comes down to uh, things like voice quality, diction, uh, whether you have speech habits that become distracting to someone listening. Um, and so, you know, any kind of training in speaking or, you know, anybody with broadcast experience or, you know, who's done voiceovers professionally, that's a no brainer. Uh, people who speak uh, in front of large groups probably would have an easier time but not it's not it's not going to be right for everybody and the decision is all around what is that experience going to be for the reader so mm -hmm. in in making the decision to go ahead and narrate your own audiobook john what are some tips that you would um would give an author to make that narration uh and uh, produce a a quality that uh, that won't distract the listener um, number one for me might be, do you feel comfortable narrating? Are you comfortable with this? Does it feel good that you're speaking into a microphone and telling your story? If that doesn't feel comfortable for you, the, and you continue reading, uh, someone on the other end who's listening to that is going to pick up on that uncomfortness or that, that uncomfortable feeling that you have, and it will become uncomfortable for them. So I think feeling good about uh, what you are doing, what you can do, is is actually at the base of it all. Uh, taking that then one step further is a little bit of knowledge about how to read. Um, and remember that you are telling your story, but you, you're telling it in a way that the reader can understand the story. And you know, everybody reads a book differently. People might have this little voice in their head when they're actually reading a book and that voice is going all the time. And you wanna be able to become that voice of the reader. Um, so you're telling a story and you're not only telling a big picture story, but every chapter, every paragraph is its own story. So you need to be able to understand what the message is that you're trying to say uh, both in fiction and nonfiction, we work in nonfiction primarily. So, so nonfiction has storytelling in it all the time, and you want to pull out and and make sure that you're telling the story that needs to be told at every moment. Every every paragraph, every chapter, every every sentence has its own little story, and you need to be able to bring that out and bring the best out of the story with your your inflections, you're going to be raising your voice, you're going to be smiling, you're going to be happy, you're going to be sad, and bring the emotion to the story when you are narrating. I think that's also uh, something that you need to be able to do and feel good about uh, to have a positive impact on, on the reader. Um, another small little antidote is when you get into reading, you're feeling good, you're, you're believing that you're telling the story, you don't want to speak too fast, and you don't want to speak too slowly. Um, 
And it's hard to know what's fast and too fast. It's hard to know what's too slow, um, but it's got to feel good. So what I suggest you do is you do a test read and try a few different speeds and maybe even send those off, that test off to a third party, a friend or you know someone who, who uh, is a, an audiobook listener and, and ask them, does this sound okay? Does, is the is the the timing and the pace okay for you? And get some feedback from from some other people before you continue recording your whole audiobook to find out. Oh my gosh, I rushed through that and nobody can understand what I'm saying. Yeah, and of course, we when we work with authors producing audiobooks, we request and require that first check. So uh, if you're working with a with a a publisher, uh, that will be your first check. Uh, as opposed to doing it on your own um, to to self publish. Now we I had a thought just as you were talking about the the diction uh, and it's escaped me now. So um, uh, mouth sounds. <clears throat> what do we do about mouth sounds? Yeah, um, you don't want to be you don't want to be also, <laughs> so, so I don't know if you can hear that, but you don't want to have your mouth very wet uh, so that we're hearing the slap of your tongue against the top of your mouth or your lips moving. You want to keep it fairly quiet. You, uh, you also want to have a clear sound in your voice, except if the story calls for, you know, something rugged like this. Uh, you want to have a clear sound to your voice um, and you don't want to be breathing heavily all the time. You don't want to uh, be and then starting your sentence and starting your sentence. You want to try to pace your breathing and try not to breathe outwardly like that as much as you can. And, and, and why? Yes, it's natural to breathe when you're speaking, but it's not natural to breathe heavily necessarily. And even if you do breathe heavily when you're speaking necessarily, naturally it's not always pleasant and nice to hear that breathing when you're in an environment uh, as a listener it's being imposed on you as a listener uh, you can't get away from it if you want to listen to that book if that breathing is bothersome you're not going to listen to the book as a reader so uh, or as a listener so that's going to turn some people off so you want to try to minimize the, that heavy breathing and if you can't then someone's going to have to cut that out and that's going to take more time and cost more money at the end of the day yeah, and if you haven't left space between the breath and when you start speaking, that becomes uh, problematic. Uh, yeah. The one and, final and, and, thing I'm just going to add I... some. I'm just going to add something there, Bonnie. Sorry. Professional narrators are trained, and they know how to do this very well. They they know how much yeah. water to sip on when they're when they're they need water, and too much water it gets your mouth too wet, and not enough gets your mouth too dry, and and then your saliva builds up, and then it gets sticky, and you hear it. So, all these little details that I've learned over the years and. In producing audio and recording narrators, narr professional right. narrators know how to do this. Uh, so there's a little bit of learning to do. So the, the thing that pulls all of this together then, just as we're getting ready to wrap up, is, uh, is the connection between the environment and the narration. And that is, um, you know, it actually takes a fair bit of time to narrate an audiobook, even a short audiobook. Uh, we've been narrating a couple that are around 25,000 words, and it's a good solid three to four hours of sitting there, <clears throat> narrating, pausing, re, uh, retaking when you stumble over the words. So it's exhausting. So if you have if you a don't have four solid hours that you can devote to this, and it might be a question of energy level that might not make sense to do it, I can tell when I'm getting fatigued, I start to stumble and make more mistakes. It's like, okay, I gotta put this down for another day. When you do that, you need to make sure when you come back the next day that you're in exactly the same spot, environment, um, you have the same setup. You can't say, oh, I'm gonna narrate sitting on the sofa today and tomorrow I'm gonna be sitting at the dining room table. It's, it, the sound is gonna be completely different. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, I'll just add some, I'll just add, I know we have to go soon, but I'll just add something real quick. So, so taking note of how far you are from the microphone is very important. There will be settings on your software and there'll be settings on your microphone. Make sure they are exactly the same every day you come back. And I highly recommend, especially if you're not a professional, to take breaks. 
because you will get fatigued and that fatigue is going to turn into and be uh, uh, heard by the listener. So you want to you want to not be tired. It's going to it's going to be reflected in how you're speaking. It's going to be re reflected in the pace that you uh, end up uh, um, speaking at, and that pace will change. The, the more tired you get, it's going to change. It might get faster, it might get slower, but it will definitely change. So you want to have the right energy. You want to come back in the same position. Put an X on the floor where your microphone was, or an X on the table. And another thing, d don't. You, you you want to be careful with where the, the the computer is that's recording and and the the device that you're reading from. Uh, it could be your iPad. Um, if it's your computer, you're going to be changing screens. You're going to be touching the computer, and you're going to hear that. So you you have to be conscious about that as well. If you let that go, the editor's going to have to cut that out. More time, more money. Yeah, and more uh, pickups, more lists of pickups. You got to redo this because there was a, a you know a click sound or or whatever it is. Um, that is, we're out of our uh, out of our time. We blew through thirty minutes there. Um, so thank you for your expertise, John, and thank you to those of you who uh, are watching. And uh, if you have any questions about audiobooks, we are always open um to answering them you can put chats in um wherever you're viewing uh this whether it's on re-record um at a later date or or not and uh we will be back next week we have um wylin terry lined up uh and we're going to talk about publishing with and for a cause um so until then and uh again thanks i'm bonnie wagner stafford from ingenium books with john Wagner Stafford from Ingenia Books. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye-bye.